Um, let me one sec. Um, first one I thought was a great case. Um, this is a patient in her um, 70s who had developed uh, shortness of breath. Um, she was worked up and had uh, heart failure with reserve ejection fraction. Um, and here's her on the left is her uh, most recent CT, which heart read uh, a few days ago. Um, and you can see here diffuse soft tissue edema, bilateral effusion. So definitely evidence of um, heart failure. Um, here's the heart. You can see the enlarged atria, which you can definitely see with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And then um, the key finding that he made was this um, very impressive diffuse enhancement of the uh, myocardium with some sparing of the so with basically the subendocardium appears spared. But um, so they the the clinical team was suspicious for AL AL uh, amyloidosis and cardiac amyloidosis um, in this case and with the restrictive cardiomyopathy and um, and basically he thought that this was consistent with the diffuse enhancement uh, of the myocardium which is something I uh, I hadn't seen we usually diagnose uh, cardiac amyloid on MR but that makes sense uh, to us because um, basically with the with amyloid, the 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 deposition of amyloid in the heart, um, the problem is basically you have an increased extracellular volume, and um, that uh, contrast can just build up, and so over time you can get diffuse enhancement. Um, mm -hmm. But here is a on the on the right is a CT from a few months ago, I think. Um, yeah, from October, um, much earlier phase, and you don't really appreciate the the uh, enhancement. Um, so she was so she um, so this was actually almost confirmed. Uh, she has a uh, her uh, she has very elevated AL, AL uh, light chains in her serum, and she's going to get worked up further for plasma cell dyscrasias with SPEP and UPEP. I think they've already ordered those um, as an outpatient. Unfortunately, she did refuse. So to diagnose uh, amyloid, you need a. To, uh, she refused the tissue biopsy, basically, and they were also going to biopsy her bone marrow to confirm uh, to, to look for myeloma. But it seems like there's a lot of evidence that this is amyloid um, diagnosed by CT with cardiac involvement. Have you ever seen that before? This... No. Yeah, I've never seen that before. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So the CT on the left, Peter, was obviously imaged relatively late. It was and imaged. Yeah. Do you remember what that was obtained for and why the imaging was, you know, relatively late compared to the usual CT we do? We 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 image early, relatively speaking. I don't know, but it's interesting because it was it said yeah. it was done in the. Uh, portal venous phase, which we, we almost never, we, do, we don't have that label on our chest CTs, but I, I remember seeing, so this is um, relatively late portal venous phase. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, I'm assuming it was done for shortness of breath and obviously the fusions here may be contributing to that. I don't see amyloid in the lungs necessarily, but. Wow. That is so interesting. Yeah. Um, this um, this case um, is also interesting. Um, this patient has a history of adenocarcinoma, and she has a uh, right upper. She's had a right upper lobectomy um, done in the past, and then uh, about a week ago, she had a um, she so she had recurrence of nodules in her left lung, which were biopsied and uh, proven to be adenocarcinoma. So she had further surgery on her left lung. Um, she had a left upper lobe wedge resection and a uh, left lower lobe superior segmentectomy. But um, Art here noticed this swirling of the of the uh, vessels and the airways 
uh, in the uh, left lower lobe. So the concern here is for at least some component of um, left lower lobe torsion post-op. Um, and here's the, uh, the sagittal kind of shows this swirling pattern as you get into the hyla of the of the uh, vessels and airways. Now the swirling is is there, and there are also, if I'm not mistaken, the staples in close proximity to the opacities. Yes, the staples are right so, there. So does the swirling affect just the lung parenchyma, and can we tell whether any of the bronchovascular bundles are twisted or turned as well? I mean, the bronchovascular bundles, yeah, it's a little tough with our contrast, but you can, I mean, the. I mean, the big ones like the, the low bar bronchi kind of thing. Yeah. So the, the bronchi, are, are they in the right place? The, I forget the anatomy, the left upper lobe and. Left upper lobe is here. Okay, so that's all right. That's all right. Yeah, so they just had the wedge resection up there, and that there is not nearly. I mean, there's almost no. Um, so here's the wedge resection on the upper lobe. And this is fairly recent post-op, so there's this soft tissue here. It might just be post-op change right around the suture line, um, and then. Um, but uh, and it's left. This swelling? Just reflecting how they happen to do that wedge resection, so-called, and the stapling of the lung, could that swirling phenomenon just reflect that mechanical effect rather than the torsion of bronchovascular bundles as such? I don't know. I am not sure. Okay. There's no contrast. I, I tend not to see this type of swirling usually, but it's I uh, yeah uh, stop. But uh, Usually they don't image a week after the surgery too. But it, it, yeah, so this so is without contrast. On the sagittal, um, you can kind of see the, I mean, the airways and the the vessels swirling around right in the Thank as you. you come in towards the hilum. Yeah, it may just be a benign swirling phenomenon. But, um, the actual mm -hmm. genesis is maybe a bit obscure. But it's intriguing that that's right where they operated with the staples, right? Mm -hmm. I can go anytime. All right. The first one I'll show you is a very interesting case. So it's a case of acute aortic syndrome. Um, it involves an elderly lady in whom they for a variety of reasons beside her age, I think because of comorbidities, we're reluctant to operate on her. So we have quite a lot of short-term follow-ups from the time of initial diagnosis. So the first series of images are from the outside hospital. She was admitted here and then there was fairly intensive imaging over a period of time. And this shows an interesting evolution of findings in acute aortic syndrome. So on the first exam that I'm showing you, I'm not gonna show you just in the interest of time, every finding, I'm just gonna concentrate on the main ones. Um, at the outside hospital, we don't have an on-contrast series, which most of us generally do to look for the hyperacute or acute hyperattenuating intramural hematoma, but that's what's present here in the ascending aorta. And I'm going to show you that it does extend into, and I hope you can see this, the brachycephalic artery. So the wall of it is also abnormal. So there's one additional finding I'm going to show you later, which is really subtle. And I will tell you that by virtue of the fact that we have pulsation or the fact that you can see here makes that invisible. So I believe it has been, it was present before, but I'm going to show it to you a little bit later. So that's time X on the seventh. And now I'm going to show you the eighth. That's not what I want to do, sorry. 
And now on the 8th, we have the same findings, but we also now have the appearance of pretty clearly involvement of the descending aorta with true and false humans, which we didn't have the previous day. And we still, of course, have the findings of intramural hematoma in relation to the ascending aorta and right brachycephalic. So I'll close that out. And then I will show you I'm going to show you everyone in the interest of time. Time difference here is a couple of days. And now you see that we have the development of pleural effusions and the amount of hematoma <clears throat> slowly increased over a period of time, over the days. And then we also had the appearance of and a slight progression of the amount of pericardial fluid. So what I want to show you here, and I'm going to show it to you again, is there's a very subtle finding here in the proximal ascending aorta, not too far above the aortic valve, in the medial aspect of the aorta. So let's go to the 14th now. And I want to show you that again. Now you can see it right here. Now it's really subtle, but there's a definite small contour abnormality, at least with respect to the contrast medium. It's almost like a little flap, as you can see there. So that turns out to be relevant because that is consistent with the so-called incomplete or limited aortic dissection. So over a period of time, the amount of intramural hematoma increased, the pericardial fluid increased, and they did decide then to operate on the person. So I'm going to show you some excerpts of the operation. And the one that's relevant to this observation is the fact that they found it here along the ascending aorta. 2CM distal to the left main ostium on the medial side of the aorta adjacent to pulmonary artery. So they did the usual operation. They replaced the ascending aorta with a hemi arch. And then they also, because of small fenestrations that I was able to see, which are very hard to see in the very thin sections, I'm not going to try and find them for you. They also did a frozen elephant trunk. So they did an operation on this patient. And this is just the post operator graph. So this is a really nice example of this rather well-described but elusive entity called limited aortic dissection. And let me just actually bring up, if you want to read about it, this is a really nice article on that entity, sometimes called incomplete dissection or limited dissection. And you can see here that it's in the spectrum of acute aortic syndrome. He has a report from 1999 in which of nine patients, none were diagnosed on preoperative imaging, very hard to diagnose. This article describes the findings, sometimes described as a small bulge, typically in that location, I'm not sure why, at least in this series, most commonly in the proximal ascending aorta. And sometimes it makes like a mushroom effect on the tear, but you don't see a classic intermedial lap in that location. Then they go on to describe the CT findings. Let me show you um, it's one of the images in the paper to show you the similarity between the ones they have in the paper and the one I just showed you. So, for example, let's say, take this one, and I'm just going to try and make this a bit big. And you can kind of see that little defect is like mushroom like right there, corresponding to what I showed you. So, this is a rather elusive entity, it's really hard to diagnose. And a nice example of so-called limited aortic dissection. So there really is a flap there. And that's certainly where blood can enter the lumen. I wonder if I've not seen these in cases in the past because they're really hard to image. I'm sure I, I have had cases that I haven't been able to diagnose that. But now I think that the lesson here is if you see an acute intramural hematoma involving the ascending aorta, 
um, if you can, first image with gating, and then always look really carefully at the proximal ACMA or even subtle findings like that to potentially diagnose the concurrent so-called limited aortic dissection. And this shows again a nice evolution of cases of the involvement of the descending aorta. Any comments? I thought this is a really interesting case. I think it's a great case, and I suspect there's many of them we just can't see the defect or abnormality. Yeah, very much so. But you can see there. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, that's it. Okay. I have a question. Um, we have uh, we were previously just doing uh, the CTA without the non-contrast and found that um, we wanted to have the the addition of the non-contrast to show an acu acute uh, hematoma uh, in the wall and also to highlight any hemopericardium that we might see in our ED patients because we have a kind of a big range of radiologists who report these. Um, and we're moving toward having a scanner with dual energy. And do any of you have experience with using the virtual non-contrast? Do you get that same um, conspicuity of intramural hematoma and hemopericardium that you get with a non-contrast? I don't know. I've never tried it, but I think I think some people have done that. I think in that context. Yeah. I think we do ours as a just a real non-con. We have dual energy technique on some of the scanners, but I don't recall us using it routinely for that. And I forgot why, um, if there was some issue with it. Okay. So Howard, I think this this case makes the point that a, uh, a an extensive intramural hematoma that involves a big segment of aorta, as your case yeah. does here, is usually um, a really an aortic dissection that hasn't manifested itself completely. And, you know, the important thing, so you will get an intramural hematoma from a proximal defect um, and not not show the, uh, the full bore double lumen sign of aortic dissection if there's no reentry point distally. But once that reentry point distally uh, you know, occurs, then you will actually have contrast flowing in that channel that was previously just a stagnant hematoma. So I think most cases of extensive intramural hematoma really are forms first of aortic dissection. If you have ongoing imaging, you may actually show it evolve to a frank dissection. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I, I think that the term limited aortic dissection is misleading here because this is not limited. This is an extensive dissection that involves ascending aorta all the way through the arch into descending right. aorta. Yeah. Just limited imaging wise or small or subtle or, yeah, imaging wise. Could you show the or first the, page of that, of that article the, so I can jot down the, the reference? Yeah. Well, the, the abnormality in the ascending aorta when you first see it appears limited relative to, to the usual intermedial flap that we see. And then, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, this is of course post-op, but notice how that very conventional intermedial flap developed in the brachiocephalic artery over the period of time and uh, where there was an intramural hematoma before. So not just the aorta, but also that artery. And that progressed over time to actually produce a pretty narrow lumen, it kind of narrow the lumen of that true lumen of the carotid is right there this being uh, post-operative imaging that I'm showing you now. Let me show you one more case. Um, this one is kind of an interesting case, particularly from the trainee point of view, and it also is a case that um, also indicates how we should always remain humble. So, here is a series of images. I'm going to somewhat arbitrarily show you one in the series. The difference between these two is three days. And one observation that we commonly make and my residents make, which is just fine, is that there is new opacity in the basal hemiphoroses. And 
the opacity sort of fades away. So some people use the term graduated opacity to indicate that the whiteness of the opacity just fades away. And on bedside radiography, when the person is recumbent or semi-recumbent, it suggests the possibility of the raw fluid accumulating. And it's a very reasonable thought, of course, when you see this kind of thing. Now, in this person, it turns out that in spite of the fact that we have the new findings, and the one thing that I do teach also is, in a general sense, if you see pulmonary vessels like this, you know these vessels are located in aerated lung. So this portion of lung is not atelectatic. But as I'll show you in a moment in this particular person, it turns out that these vessels here and these vessels here are actually located in the right middle lobe and the left upper lobe because this is what the lower lobes look like. So they are pretty airless. So this is substantial lower lobe atelectasis simulating pleural fluid. Yes, there's a touch of pleural fluid there, but the opacities on that bedside radiograph are due to the atelectatic lung. And the vessels that we're seeing here are actually just the right middle lobe vessels, and this is the left upper lobe vessel. So this is very humbling. It can be really hard to make a distinction between the opacity of pleural fluid and atelectatic lung or a combination of the two. And I'm always fine with saying that we're not really sure how much pleural fluid is present, how much atelectasis is present when interpreting bedside radiographs. But this one was particularly interesting because these vessels are actually not in the lower lobes on either side. So I thought that was kind of instructive and humbling too. All right, Jack. All right, thanks. All right, Lucy, you can go next. Let me make you the presenter. So Lucy, I don't hear you. You may be muted on your other line. Yep, now I'm all on. There you um, are. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah. I'm here. Okay, so this is a follow-up CT scan um, for a patient, a woman who is, who's in her 60s, who has, as you can see, quite extensive uh, bronchial wall thickening as well as bronchiectasis, the airways are larger than, you know, when you can make out the accompanying vessel, they're definitely larger than the accompanying vessel. And as we come up, um, there's quite a lot of mucus plugging. Uh, I'll just put it on soft tissue windows here, just a second. You can see that the trachea is also quite thickened. And uh, appearances were similar on her CT from five years prior. Uh, and she's followed by a pulmonologist and she has a history of ulcerative colitis, which you know I know is, uh, we know is associated with bronchiectasis. But this is really quite a florid case of bronchiectasis with bronchitis and also tracheitis. Uh, and in looking up whether this has been described, it has been described, there are a few case reports, but I thought I would show it here to see whether uh, any of you have comments on this. Um, have you seen Have you seen this? Would you entertain other uh, diagnoses? So I've seen a couple of cases, one with ulcerative colitis and one with Crohn's disease. Um, and interesting, it, it most commonly occurs years after the abdominal disease has been around, often if it's quiescent or something. Um, but it can present acutely as well. The other thing they can get is uh, constrictive bronchiolitis, so they can get a small airway injury. Um, but yours is a really nice example of that. And um, it's not one that's commonly, I think, thought about. They can also get pulmonary fibrosis. And then, of course, all the drug-related injuries. And interesting, she's got, looks like, asbestos plaques on top of that. But Yeah. yeah. 
That's yeah, so not a lot of, I don't have expiration images, but not a lot of, you know, yeah, to suggest a lot of obstructive small artery disease on just these, these images. Yeah, that's okay, a, and then I have a really nice example of it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and let me just bring up my next one. So this is a patient with uh, COVID, actually, who we were looking at uh, last night. And let me see, let me just put the astute wall of seeing, seeing the, a keyword. But um, so this is the uh, initial, so he had some some x-rays coming up, you know, with, with you know, some moderate uh, COVID that got worse. And then he had this uh, chest x-ray uh, with these apical pneumothoraces. You can see that, you know, there's air outlining the uh, aorta here. So, you know, suggesting maybe some pneumomediastinum, which he, um, you know, later you can, we can see, uh, oh, sorry, you're not seeing the chest x-ray. Let me know. Let me just put that up. Hold on a second. Right, so here's his COVID uh, pneumonia looking pretty typical, right? And then uh, this is just the next day. He presents with these pneumothoraces. Um, and probably a little bit of pneumomediastinum. He had a, uh, what was thought to be a fairly uh, traumatic intubation. Um, and then on CT of the chest, a few days later, this is maybe three days later, we can see really extensive subcutaneous emphysema and pneumomediastinum. He has chest tubes for these uh, pneumothoraces that he developed, you know, and the initial, it's really under pressure, isn't it? You can see it's really, um, you know, kind of compressing the mediastinum um, and extending into this uh, extra peritoneal space that we know about. <laughs> Dr. Mann, you'll remember that case you showed on <laughs> Twitter. <actually. laughs> um, and then uh, this was his most recent one, which is the one I saw. Uh, so this is done, you know, course, you know, like at 1030 at night. Um, and uh, before you leave this one, can you show us if you don't mind, can you show us the trachea and its relationship, excuse me, the endotracheal tube in relation to yeah. the trachea and so on? Yeah, so here is the trachea with the endotracheal tube within it. And it's a little bit pressed against the anterior wall, isn't it? Um, I'll put on a coronal image here. I mean, a sagittal image to show. It's really kind of pressed against there, isn't it? But no defect in the large airways that we could see. Um, and then looking, where I thought it was most obvious was in the coronals, looking at the uh, right middle lobe in particular, we can see the visceral pleura here. And then there are these locules of air, which look a bit non-anatomic. Um, and then tra tracking back, we can see, you know, a little vessel with a paired bronchus and then a pulmonary vein, another pulmonary vein here with air just surrounding it. And you can follow that all the way back to the to the mediastinum. So I thought this was a really nice example of pulmonary interstitial emphysema uh, with the Macklin effect, probably ruptured alveoli, which, you know, uh, Kirsten Young, I think, is here. She's my uh, one of the pulmonary fellows who's sort of hanging out with me this week. And she was saying, you know, I always say pneumothorax first. And I was like, oh, that's weird, because this is pneumomediastinum. And when I went back, I'm like, no, he did present, actually, initially with pneumothoraces. So, um, I'm thinking that this is an alveolar rupture with pneumothoraces and then also Macklin effect causing uh, pneumomediastinum. So I just thought I'd see what you yeah. what you had to think about that. You all had any comments? Yeah, it looks like there. Could have, could have, could have, could have, could have, 
So with Macklin's original description, uh, what he talked about was pneumothorax derived from pneumomediastinum derived from the interstitial pulmonary emphysema. So the interstitial pulmonary emphysema decompresses into mediastinum. Mediastinum can rupture into pleural space. He emphasized that it doesn't go the other way. You don't get pneumothorax leading to pneumomediastinum. But you commented on how distended the mediastinum is here. So that really sets it up to rupture. So that's another pathway. It could have been pneumothorax via pneumomediastinum. Yeah. And the bilaterality is good for that. Pneumothorax, he didn't really have the so much pneumomediastinum, did he? I mean, he probably had some, but. Yeah, but you, yeah. So, I mean, I can't, you know, um, if he, since he had bilateral pneumothorax, right? I mean, he would have had to have the, the, um, some parenchymal issue on the, on the, on the left side as well. Right. So, um, but the pneumomediastinum could account for both pneumothoraces. Right. Yes. And, you know, on your initial images, that pneumothorax was quite large at, at the apices. When you have just a, a skinny uh, pneumothorax, it can be on both sides. Sometimes that's just extension of pneumomediastinum outside the parietal pleura over the lung apices, and it's really pseudo-pneumothorax. But it, right. pseudo-pneumothorax is not as big and fat as the chest radiograph showed in your case. So that was, that was real pneumothorax. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and have you, I mean, certainly pneumothorax has been described in COVID. I, this is, I haven't seen a case quite this florid with pneumomediastinum. Um, and is there any treatment, do you know, for, I mean, because it seems like if you're intubated, you're, you're kind of just pumping air through the lung and into the mediastinum. <laughs> You're kind of contributing yeah. to the problem, right? Yeah, but it's unavoidable. I think they just try to use yeah. this with as much as they can get away with in a general sense. And it's just, it's really problematic sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know the specific treatment for pneumomediastinum. I don't think that people try to decompress it. I think it's such a distensible space Mm. It probably doesn't generate a lot of pressure on veins and say uh, impair venous filling of the heart. Right. So it may look terrible on chest radiographs, but may not be physiologically that. Yeah, it's still round and yeah. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. I can't remember if I mentioned it, but there was a study out of New York, I think NYU, where they found a higher rate of pneumothorax in uh, COVID-associated ARD or barotrauma in COVID-associated ARDS compared to they did a they used historical match controls pre-pandemic. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was a pretty substantial higher number. Mm. All right. Well, thank you, Lucy. You're welcome. David, do you have any cases? Not this week. All right, well, I can show some. All right, it's going to be a start with a little bit of vascular stuff again. So um, this is a interesting case. Uh, we don't see a lot of CTs of of VADs. Uh, this patient has a HeartMate two. I don't have a radiograph. Um, chronic heart failure and the HeartMate 2 is uh, just to refresh everyone's memory is this big uh, pump down here it looks like this um, and it's usually put in in the upper abdomen and then there's a metallic limb fought with a, that's with a little um, flexible limb that's sewn into the left uh, ventricle ventricle apex right there actually it's got a metal limb going to it and then on the right um, there's the outflow limb which has the flexible portion here called the bend relief I know Travis has talked about this and that's anastomosed into the ascending aorta and this was a previous study and you can see there's the anastomosis it looks really good they put some packing in here to prevent adhesions and stuff there was a little bit of irregularity in there and he had had a history of a previous VAD that had to be replaced because of thrombus and he had a known driveline infection you can see there's the drive line and they're just down here um i'm sorry there's that's the 
hey, the drive line's down here. Um, you can see there's some stranding around it, some soft tissue thickening. So this was a known uh, staph infection. And he's been on treatment for that. But he presented um, recently with uh, the alarms for high pressure flows. Um, and then interestingly, in the emergency department, developed some abdominal pain. So you can see the, the site of uh, the driveline infection looks a little bit better. But what's kind of cool is um, if you look on the outflow tract, um, there's some new areas of in the bend relief of filling defects. So there's the lumen, and now we've got this little filling defect there. There's another one up here. There's some of that irregularity that's increased. And then right at the anastomosis, there's a little, looks like a little thrombus or something hanging out there. So this is presumably all thrombus forming in the bend relief and the anastomosis. And I think the explanation for his abdominal pain is right back here. We're a little early, but most of the spleen is fairly enhanced, and we have this nice wedge-shaped area. So presumably a splenic infarct from an embolic event. Um, but we don't, as I just don't see a lot of these uh, imaged um, typically uh, post-procedural um, so these are kind of the things you're looking for is pseudoaneurysms, dehiscence, which of course could be catastrophic. But um, when the pressure, when the device picks up slow sluggish flows or elevated pressures, uh, you kind of want to look specifically at the outflow tract to make sure there's not a mechanical obstruction or in this case thrombus. And, and this may be infected but given that he's got this chronic staph infection at the drive line, which he is uh, on suppressive therapy for. Um, this is something I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, this is a patient who presented with acute myocardial infarction and uh, severe uh, heart failure and was actually um, beyond a VAD and got a total artificial heart. And this is what it looks like on a radiograph. It's got four valves, and that's how you can tell, and then two balloon-like structures. Uh, it's called a syn syncardia. Um, and I'll show you some images of it. So this is what it looks like, or sort of what it would look like here. So there's two uh, ventricle pumps here, and then they're externalized, and the patient carries around a, a system that, that that manages the pumping. They're made out of a silicone and stuff. Um, and this is sort of what they do. So the native atria are still there, and they resect the ventricles and put these this in there and connect one to the aorta and one to the pulmonary artery. And then on this one, this is the external called the freedom here the one here but this is what it this is what it looks like here and you can see there are the four valves but what's kind of cool is I've, I've never seen a ct of one so this patient you can see has an open chest has a pneumonia um, but you can actually see what this looks like on the anatomy so there are the two uh, prosthetic ventricles that we showed you with the little balloons you can see they're filled with air and then you can see where they're at. there's there there's the av valve there connecting to the right atrium, and there's the AV valve here connecting to the left atrium, the uh, aortic outflow right here. So there's that aortic valve going to the ascending aorta, and then the anastomos, the um, other, the, the right ventricle to the um, pulmonary artery there. So it's really a, bi it's a total artificial heart in the sense it's two ventricles, um, artificial ventricles. And these can be used as a bridge to transplant. Um, I guess it could be destination therapy, but I don't know about that. We, I, I, again, I haven't seen one of these in I think it, a really long time. We just don't do a lot of them. Um, but as, as our transplant program grows, I suspect we may see more of these. But this was kind of cool to see one of those. So it's called a syncardia. And uh, if you ever see someone who looks like they have these four big clunky heart valves and gas in a bad place, that's all that that is. All right. Um, let's see. This was kind of a cute case and something I you know, um, I don't think I've seen very often. We don't CT a lot of patients with asthma routinely, but this was a trauma. It was like a motor vehicle crash, a young woman in her 20s, and she did carry a history of asthma. And that, I found that out because I was looking, as I was looking at her scan, I noticed, for example, this little, let me blow it up a little bit, this little irregularity of the tracheal wall. And then as I went down, I saw another one. And then there's just a whole bunch of these little tiny outpouchings in the tracheal wall. Um, she had the one, the bronchial little diver ticket. We see these all the time, almost in every one, it seems like, or at least older patients, and tend to just ignore them. But she had more than just that. She had a little bit of irregularity of these airways out there. I thought the folds were a little thicker and maybe just all related to her asthma, but I thought she had some other little outpouchings 
it was down in the middle lobe, maybe it was one. Yeah, right here in the origin of the middle lobe. Some of that may be secretion, but to me that looked extra luminal. So I think she's got all these bronchial and tracheal tiny diverticula. And you know, I've seen really bad ones in patients with cystic fibrosis. We've seen tracheal diverticula all the time, usually right in the right uh, retrotracheal space. They usually occur right about up in here and maybe a little lower, but I've not seen that in asthma. Um, and I don't, I don't think her asthma was particularly bad. I didn't see it, but um, we just don't image them. I'm curious if people have ever seen little tiny trachea and bronchial diverticula aside from the ones we almost always see at the carina. No, I haven't noticed that. I've seen some near the carina. Um, I think typically in patients that are labeled as having COPD, sometimes they do, of course, have emphysema. And I remember hearing, or sometime, uh, some time ago, there was a talk on on um, one of the French radiologists that showed many cases of this in patients with COPD, and he described them as air in the ducts of submucosal glands in those locations, at least the ones that are relatively big near the tracheal carina, at least for those, mm -hmm. as yeah, a finding in COPD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the wrong uh, re, uh, pro, uh, uh, reconstruction for, for volume rendered, but you can see there's probably a little out pouching there. I was just playing around with that. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, I've seen, I think with just chronic obstructive diseases, so asthma, I guess, is in there. Maybe people who cough a lot too, but I see these bronchial diverticula, particularly in smokers and patients with other airway disease. Okay, um, we'll do a little infection. So this is a patient who is a double lung transplant plant recipient is in their 60s, and um, this is pretty soon post-operative, which I think is what surprised me a little bit about the organism here. So you see a little bit of pleural stuff, pneumomediastinum, the usual post-operative stuff. But the patient developed, um, had developed a fever post-operative and a leukocytosis and had this area of consolidation in the left lower lobe which you know, could have just been some aspiration or something, nothing terribly exciting. The pleural spaces look pretty good. Uh, but then progressed uh, about um, three weeks later, was not getting better. And on re-imaging, had this cavity in that area of consolidation. So now there's a cavity here. And you can see a little communication probably with an airway down there. And then developed this loculated complex pleural effusion. There's some... Um, other stuff, there's a couple nodules too. There's one there and a couple other ones floating around. So, uh, and there's a little cavity up here. So, of course, we have to think about infection and then you'd be worried about this pleural space. Although um, you could just get loculations postoperatively, but the other pleural space looks a lot happier. So, they actually sampled this pleural fluid and it uh, grew out uh, an organism I did not expect to see this early, and that's rhizopus. Um, so, you know, David's shown us a lot of cases of this, and I think Howard too is a mucor family, a mucor mycosis, but rhizopus being in that family, and of course it's a difficult organism to treat, but I've not seen one this early out. I mean, we're talking probably less than 30 days post-operative. Usually occurs a little bit later, um, but when they're pretty heavy immune suppressed. So, I'm, I'm not, and it's usually acquired out, out in the community um, just because it's, it's kind of everywhere, but uh, causing uh, parenchymal disease. So the cavity and the nodules all go along with that, but I've not seen a rise of pus empyema before. Um, but so it, Jeff, what was, uh, what was the reason for transplant? What was his preceding lung disease? I believe he was a pulmonary fibrosis. Had he been on steroids or something immune compromising? As... Um, not to my knowledge. If I remember he was IPF, I could be wrong, but... Um, not a diabetic or... Not, I don't know that. I just, yeah, it's... I wonder if there was something pre-existing white cell dysfunction and immune compromise. That's a good question. Yeah, and they're so heavily immune compromised with lung transplants. But I, I, I mean- Yeah, I can't remember diagnosing a fungal infection so quickly after, right. after transplant. Right, it's usually gram negatives and sort of the typical nosocomial, you know, hospital acquired type nosocomial infections. But yeah, so, but a, a cavity like that's good for a fungus and of course mucor rise of pus and all those cause a lot of necrosis we don't have a bird's nest here but uh, interesting it started that early even with the chest tube still and so it was i think it was already brewing i mean the other possibility was it wasn't a donor but i find that highly unlikely given that 
they don't transplant immunocompromised patients lungs into people usually okay um yeah. let's see this was kind of cool one of my residents shared this case with me and i i don't think i've seen this image before so this patient is in his 70s i believe or 60s and present has a history of uh squamous cell of the larynx had a total laryngectomy and permanent tracheostomy and presented with a fever of unknown origin and so they did a ct scan sort of try to figure out what's going on see if he had recurrent cancer or some kinds of infections of course you would expect maybe aspiration with head and neck surgery but you can see he's got this sort of soft tissue stranding in the subcutaneous fat of his chest wall uh, kind of bilateral it's not quite water attenuation there's no discrete abscess you can still make out the fascial planes um, and it goes quite a bit down and you can see a lot, almost over the anterior trunk and um, so he um, ended up seeing um, dermatology because he had like these uh, it was just some redness and and, and um, palpable abnormalities and uh, they did a biopsy I'll just show the pet first um, which is quite impressive you can see all this uptake in the in the subcutaneous fat so kind of looks like a paniculitis um, which of course inflammation of the sub-Q fat sometimes but they did a biopsy and this is what's something I never heard of before it's a variant of, it's called paniculitis like uh, cutaneous uh, subcutaneous uh, t-cell lymphoma and these are CD8 positive cells with uh, cytotoxic features. It's uh, kind of a, apparently this one's particularly lower grade. He was treated with just like cyclophosphamide and some, I think a little steroids and stuff and has been doing okay, but it's, um, it, it mimics paniculitis. And so it's actually a term they call paniculitis like uh, T cell lymphoma. I've seen T cell lymphomas before in the skin or, or, or cutaneous lymphomas, but usually they present as solid masses and not, I, I've not seen it present like this. So this was kind of a really cool case and the pet kind of made it nice as well. Wow. That so with, you think that's, is, is there any implication that's related to some chemotherapy that he might have had or just a, another disease in this poor guy that already had squamous cancer? I'm guessing the latter. I don't think it's associated with anything, but it's so rare, it's hard to know. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that was kind of cool. Was there a, was there a more discrete nodule? Just yeah, that's just a sebaceous cyst. It was on his, the, I had an older CT. Yeah, you're talking right there. Yeah, that's a sebaceous. Oh yeah, that's, yeah. That's a, well, that's dramatic. I've never. No, seen no, I haven't. I, I guess the one, the one or two cases of T continuous lymphoma I've seen, they're, they're usually masses, not infiltrating. But yeah, the dermatopathologist had a nice description of it, and and that's the term they used, and the uh, and it and it is a, it's sort of a. It's sort of a low-grade lymphoma, I think, in that the clonality is very, it's not, it's its a subtle clonality. I don't know enough about it to try to explain it, but it sounded like they, they were confident it was lymphoma, but it wasn't the most aggressive one. So along those lines, and I'm curious what you all think. Um, so this is an uh, interesting patient. So this patient is a middle-aged female who carries a diagnosis of lupus confirmed by usual criteria. And this is her a while ago, and she has clearly a nice example of serositis. We can see these pleural effusions. They're small, but they're, there's loculations. There's some thickening, and there's a very small pericardial effusion. She had chest pain at that point. Um, anyway, she recently presented with new chest pain, and her anti-double-stranded DNA titers are way up. And so they did a, uh, at the outside hospital, they did a CT angio, and you can see there's a lot of collateral flow. So I want to focus your attention here on the mediastinum. So we don't see a brachycephalic vein, and this is a left injection. So if I window it really densely, we see contrast coming in, and it just kind of stops here, sort of at the where the ax, the subclavian uh, vein would be, and there's all this collateralization. So I suspect there is a, a subacute probably, um, or maybe an acute, but there's a left brachycephalic venous thromb, uh, thrombosis. And now, if you look in the mediastinal fat, and I'll, let me put these up side by side, move this around a little bit. Uh, where's that little separator? Uh, there we go. Um, bring this one down. Uh, it's going to, okay, it's going to do that. But you can see that. Command. command. Command G. G. Okay. Command G to separate them. There we go. Thank you, Howard. You can see how the fat 
beforehand was nice and clean. And if we go now, we look at the arch vessels. The, the vessels themselves look okay, but there's all this edema in the fat around it. And away from the brachycephalic vein, which would be about there, but even tracking up into the upper mediastinum, and then just a little bit of strandiness down there. And she did have some chest pain that's sort of localized to that area, but there's not like a discrete area like we see with uh, um, the fat torsion in the, in the mediastinal fat, or there's no abscess there. So I'm wondering if this is sort of like a, another form of paniculitis, which has been, is described with lupus, uh, usually in the cutaneous tissues, but that the mediastinal fat is inflamed. And whether it's secondary or primary, this, um, this, left brachycephalic vein thrombosis that may even be more chronic. She does not have uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Her serositis is better. You see the pericardium is cleared up. She still has this pleural thickening in these chronic effusions, so probably chronic from just recurrent bouts of serositis. But um, I don't know. I've, I've not seen imaging of a lupus case of, of, I guess, paniculitis or whatever you want to call it. But it's sort of a mediastinitis without the typical abscess we see. And the, the lymph nodes aren't really reactive or anything. And, oh, that's very curious. I there was not a bloodstream in the way of infection or anything like that. I mean, it wasn't a septic thrombosis. No, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's one one possibility. You know, I, I can imagine seeing some edema around a, 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 an acute thrombophlebitis, but it's, it just seems odd that it's coming all the way up here into the upper mediastinum, kind of away from it. And so, it's pretty localized too. Yeah. Pretty robust collaterals too. There's some really nice intercostals and you can see uh, internal mammary branches going in there. So... All right, and then um, the last case, let's see, did I already show that one? I think that's it. Yeah, no, that's all of them. Perfect, well, we're just about at the hour, so thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And great cases. Thanks, everyone. All right, I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.